I'd uh, like to welcome you to the uh, last CIE lecture for this season. Uh, sorry, it's been a bit delayed past our usual date, but uh, I've had difficulty uh, getting speakers. But uh, Graham here has uh, kindly offered to give us uh, a talk, and we're always glad to see you, Graham. So uh, hopefully we shall have an entertaining evening. Uh, the only other event I'm trying to arrange for this season is a visit to PD Ports uh, later in June. When I've got the details finalised, I'll uh, put out a, a mail shot. For anybody who's not on our mailing list, if you'd like to join, um, the stand there has got some little forms in the front. If you could jot down your email address on there and give it to me, then I can add you to the mailing list. So, commercial over. I shall hand over to Graham. Absolutely. Thank you, Graham. Right. Understand, so this is a talk that I did for IOM3 about two years ago, just after I retired from CPI. So it's a CPI talk, although I only do some strategic advice for CPI now. And it's about looking at how you address the climate change through resource efficiency rather than just changing everything. And there's no real right answer in it. It's just a way of looking at things. Oh, there we go. And I'm going to talk a bit about background. I'll talk about where we are, what we're facing, what we could do, about becoming more resource efficient, about how natural systems can help us, and then just a set of thoughts at the end of things. So the background about this is we talk about saving the planet, but actually the planet's fine. It, it doesn't really need us, it's us that's the problem. We are the ones that need to change, we're the ones that need saving. And the thought process behind all of this, which is quite philosophical really, is that if we're part of a larger system that's been being made for four and a half billion years. So thinking that we can control it in the next 10 or 15 years is a bit of a pipe dream really. And we need to accept that we need to change to work with the system or and stuff about sustainability. Um, but this is a, a pricey of the most important sentence in the whole thing. And it's about sustainable development. And it says, sustainable development, development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In essence, sustainable development is a process of change in which exploitation of resources, the direction of investments, the orientation of technical development, and institutional change are all in harmony, and they enhance current and future potential to meet human needs and aspirations. And I think the problem is that at the moment, what we try to do is make point changes that we think are going to fix everything else, and they don't, because one thing impacts another thing, and that impacts other things. But the critical thing here is, as technologists and engineers, we've got a heck of a lot to contribute to this. And we need to make our voices more heard if we're going to actually have the impact that we need to have. Now, if you look at the principles of sustainability, it's about balancing between economic factors, between environmental and natural resource factors and societal factors in summary. So economic factors are about creating the wealth to do things and to continue doing things. The environmental ones are about the impact on the resources that we've got available to us. And the societal ones are about us helping uh, us having healthy, happy and full lives. And they're equally important. And for a long period of time, we've been more focused on the economic ones than a lot of the other ones. And we're beginning to realise that that balance is important, but we're not actually dealing with it particularly brilliantly. This next set of slides is about how we've got to where we are. So there's quite a lot of numbers in here, but just bear with me while I show you them. So. This is a graph of life expectancy in Massachusetts from, from 1850 up to last year. What's happened, and the, the, the purple dots are, are female and the blue dots are males. And they're white people. Hispanics survive actually quite a lot longer, generally speaking. But in 1850, most of us sitting in this room would have died by now. Because the average age was somewhere around the 40s. And you can see that now it's somewhere in the 75 to 85 bracket. And you can also see what an impact COVID had on life expectancy in America. This is Massachusetts, which is 
a northern state which was, was quite on the ball about what it was doing relative to some of the others. But in 150 years, life expectancy is doubled in the developed world. Females live longer than males. The developing world is actually following this trend, but a lot of the developing world is still down at the bottom here. And also, like the, the point I've just made, life expectancy actually fell in the US. And you can, you can see that since the mid-1980s, even without COVID, the trend in life expectancy has flattened out. So we're getting to a point where people aren't living that much longer now, but they are living to a fair age. The next one is about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, because population seems to be quite important with that. So the green line here is population, and the blue dots are carbon dioxide emissions. Now, from uh, the 60s and 70s, the dots, you got numbers every year, and they've taken the amount of lower observatory data in Hawaii. These dots are ice core dots that take us back to the 1800s. Um, but you can see that there's a very strong correlation between CO2 in the atmosphere and the number of people, um, which is obviously related to the fact that people are living longer. There are probably two things that made people live longer. The Industrial Revolution, which gave people more access to warmth, but also healthcare started to happen in the, the beginning of that rapid rise. But clearly, there's a strong relationship between CO2 in the atmosphere and the number of people. However, the CO2 in the atmosphere per million people is falling. And it's, again, flattening out a bit, but it con it's continuing to fall. Now, obviously, this is a very small number because I've divided a small number by a big number. But CO2 concentration per million people in the atmosphere is falling. So we are actually getting relatively more efficient, even though the population is rising. The next thing is, this is money of, money of the year, so it's kind of slightly misleading because it doesn't take inflation into account. But food prices are rising, and this is the European wheat price year on year since 1259. So you can get a daily forward price for wheat from 1259 to today. And the, it was at Exeter, the first forward market, the first uh, traded market in wheat was in Exeter in, in 1259. Now, Okay, it's a bit sad, and it doesn't really show you a terrible lot until you get into the mid 1600s. But it does show you that that number's going up. And this bit here is the war in Ukraine. But in actual fact, if you look at the trend, what's happened there isn't off miles off the trend, even though some event has made something happen. So the trend would have been going along anyway. So wheat price, if this is in dollars per ton, it's rising. It appears to be linked to population again, the blue number here, population figure. Uh, it's also affected by the weather, but that's another story that I'll talk to you about on another day. Um, and there are cycles that have an impact here. And that there's a 49 point moving average in here, uh, which is roughly the Kodratiev cycle. He, he was a Russian economist, he told Stalin that basically there was gonna be a massive collapse in prices to do with uh, overhangs in money and changes in climate. So he got killed, but the cycles lived on beyond him. And there's also a cycle in planets um, where planets move and that changes the gravitational field on the earth. So this is another talk for another day, but it does have an impact on temperature globally and it has an impact on where water is. So El Ninos and El Ninias are related to that and related to the fact that every 179 years, Saturn, Jupiter, the Earth and the Sun all end up in a line um, for a period of a couple of years. And that actually has an impact on some of these major cycles. But that's another, it's something, to, like I said, it's something to talk about another day because, but the point of it is that there are things happening to us because of the way where our planet is and how it fits in the system that we have no control over, but they have impact on things that we think we can control when in actual fact we probably can't. Um, and you can see that so this is one of those things. And wheat's just an example of it. And it's, it's a strange example because of the fact that the data system is so long. The next point to make is one of the things that often lets us down is our lack of efficiency. The UK loses 55% of the fuel it uses for electricity generation, conversion, transmission, and distribution losses. 
and it has done since it used mostly coal, and it still does now, even though the mix of energy generation has changed. And every year, uh, the government produces a, a, a Sankey diagram of all the energy inputs and outputs in the UK. And it doesn't just do electricity, I'll just put the electricity bit out of here, it does all of those things. And if you just put in UK energy Sankey diagram, you'll find it. And you can find every year, so about the last 20 years, and they're, on, they're disturbed and they're sad, sadly unchanging, actually, apart from the consumption rising. A considerable amount of those losses that were heat. Now, whether they still are, that's open to question. Um, but the first, when I first wrote this probably four or five years ago, we were much more gas driven than the way we were producing most of our electricity, well, and coal, thermally driven, if you like. The other thing is that when we use gas to generate heat, we can be up to 90% efficient. When we use it to generate electricity, we're only about 35, 40% efficient. So our boilers in our houses are actually not far up 90% efficient on average, whereas the, the gas that's being burnt in our power stations to make electricity are only 30, 35% efficient. Now, if you use the heat, uh, so you've got a combined heat and power system or something like that, you can get very high. When I used to plan the ICI assets, because I used to be the planner for the, so did Mark actually, <laughs> before me, the integrated assets when ICI were here, our power station was about 85% efficient because we used all the heat to generate loads of steam for the processes. So it, it's not impossible. And if, if we were Dutch or German or a lot of other nations in Europe, this number would be more than double that because we'd be using the heat. Whereas in the UK, we have a free market for us to choose our heat from wherever we choose. So therefore, we throw away all the stuff that we use when we make our electricity that way. The, the next problem we face is we now are often turning our electricity that we haven't generated very efficiently back into heat again. So we're losing a load more of it. And one of the problems is that the incentives can drive the inefficiency by rewarding the wrong kinds of behaviours. But the main, that's just an example, you know, you can come up with loads of them actually. But improving efficiency in general is a significant technical and political opportunity to reduce our carbon emissions. And it applies to almost every plant you make. And I'll show you an example, another one from my history in a bit later on in the talk. So the next thing uh, is not quite following on particularly well is carbon dioxide emissions by country. So this is a plot of most countries this is carbon dioxide emission per person in tons per year. And this is the GDP per person in US dollars uh, corrected for 2019 for everybody. And you can see that CO2 emissions generally rise with GDP, so rise with affluence, but there seems to be a leveling out somewhere between five and 11 tons of carbon dioxide per person. So nearly all the nations are in here. Now, the other thing to notice is the vast majority of nations are not particularly rich, and they're still on the upward trend of, of, of emission. Um, and there are special cases. So the UK is actually here. So we're towards the bottom of that range now, although I'll show you that that's partly because we've exported all our carbon dioxide emissions to somebody else, and we're just pretending that we're being more efficient as a consequence. Luxembourg, very rich people with lots of steelworks. So they emit loads of carbon dioxide. Qatar, United Arab Emirates, people that Kuwait, people that produce lots of oil and gas, so generally speaking, have lots of carbon dioxide emissions because of flare stacks and all of that kind of stuff. And then people that live in countries that need air conditioning, like Canada, Australia, the United States, are actually tend to be above the line as well. Now, whether that's the reason or not, I haven't got a clue. This is just a quick analysis of the data. But most people are in this space here. And even though they're getting richer, around this 25, 30,000 US dollars income, emissions seem to level out a bit. Now, this one looks at how population growth and affluence are affecting CO2 emissions. So, in 2021, the world population was about 7.9 billion people. The average carbon dioxide emission per person is 4.7 tonnes per year globally, according to the UN and NEDGA, which is the European Union's system. So if you multiply those two numbers together, then human carbon dioxide emissions in that year were 37 billion tonnes. If 
she said everybody was going to be as rich as us. So that they're in that seven, they're between, halfway between that five and 11 number. They're producing about five, seven and a half tons of carbon dioxide per person. That would mean that if everyone was in rich as us, we'd, they'd be making 59 billion tons. So that's 59% more carbon dioxide emissions if the world was the same affluence and the same affluence that we are. If you look forward to 2050, Population forecast 9.7 billion now, which has actually come down from 9.8 billion, which it was the year before. So that's kind of semi good news. The carbon, say the carbon dioxide emissions stayed the same across the globe, then that would take us to 45 and a half billion tons, which is 23% more than we, we are now. But if everybody was affluent, then that would take us to 73 billion tons, which is 97% more. Now, when I first started doing this, the good, this is the good news. <laughs> That was about 120% more because this number was bigger and this number was bigger. So we have made some impact in, in, in make that number. These two numbers are, are down a bit from where they were when I first did it. And this number's down a bit. So actually, those numbers aren't quite as bad as they were, but they're still pretty scary numbers. And dealing with that much carbon dioxide is a challenge and catching it and burying it under the ground isn't really a viable option. You've really got to think about how you're not going to make it. But like I say, the long term trend is actually improving because emissions per person are reducing, the population forecasts are falling as well. This one is selecting changes in carbon dioxide per capita and GDP per capita by country and comparing 2007 to 2021. Um, they're just, they're not quite random, but they're not far off random. You picked out countries. So the US in 2007 was emitting about 19 and a half million uh, tons per person of carbon dioxide and their GDP was about $41,000. In 2021, they're down to 14.24, but their GDP has gone up massively and their population, I mean, their population has actually risen as well, but not by much. I haven't put, the, I should have put the 2007 population on because that's actually quite an interesting comparison in itself. But if you look along here, most countries, so the Germans have come down, but not by much. We'll miss the Chinese for a second. The Italians have come down quite a lot. The UK has not, not far come down by 50%. France has come down a bit. We'll miss India. The EU has actually come down, but the world has gone up. And the two main people who've gone up a lot are China, who've gone up from 5.6 to 8.7. And they're still not particularly well off relative to everybody else. And the Indians who've gone from one to two, which is 100%. And they're also, sorry, not very well off at all compared to everybody else. But these two got an awful lot of people, like a third of the people in the world, not far on. And part of what's happened is a lot of the stuff we use now gets made in China. So we've exported some of our carbon dioxide emissions to the Chinese, but they're also getting richer and there are more of them. And the same is happening to the Indians. And you can see that the Indians have got a long, long way to go. So things could get quite significantly, or change quite significantly in the coming years. But the challenge is, that we've got an inexorably increasing need for food and shelter because of the growing population. We've doubled our life expectancy since 1850, and we've got 8 billion people now in 2022. At the end of 2022, we just went over 8 billion people, and we're forecasting we'll have 9.7 billion by 2050. Generally speaking, people are getting richer, affluence is rising, and we've shown that emissions rise with affluence. Now, the high affluence or countries like ourselves it's not rising much, and in fact, it's falling. But the lower affluence countries, it's rising quite quickly. And then there's the, the other issue of resource consumption, which is, so we use carbon dioxide as a pr proxy for everything else, but in actual fact, everything else is what's changing. So there's only a finite amount of resource out there, and it won't last forever. More affluence appears to equal more waste. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rises in proportion to population. So that puts immense stress on the finance, finance system that we, look, that we live in. So, 
what are we going to do about it? Or what could we do outside of the things that we're already thinking about? So you can make and share it. It doesn't say on here, but this was actually a shell calculation or a shell argument that, and they did it in two. They did this, these two things separately, but CO2 emissions and waste equals the number of people times the affluence of the people times the efficiency which each of those people uses the resources they're consuming times the efficiency with which industry supplies them with things uses those resources. You might want to put any effort into controlling that because that's not really fair. You aren't actually going to put any effort into controlling this, although not deliberately, but people do. But there are massive opportunities in these two based on what we've said before about how inefficient some of the things that happen are. So we need to become more efficient in our use of resources if we're going to address this emissions and waste problem. Now, this is these definitely are two CPI slides that are here. A lot of this other stuff's what I think, but low carbon products with increased functionality is are things that we ought to be trying to do. Processes that use less water and recycle more fresh water. I haven't talked about water much, but it is a big issue, particularly fresh water. Processes that use fewer virgin materials and recycle more because it means we don't dig holes all over the earth. There's like, I think there's about two and a half kilos of gold per 20, two and a half thousand tons of rock or something like that. Something like that. But then all the gold that's in that computer and I throw it away it probably ends up in the landfill or there isn't a process to get it out easily at the moment. And zero carbon energy sufficient max self-sufficient manufacturing, things that are more efficient than than they have been in the past. So what the world needs from us as industrialists is less pollution, less consumption, and we need to deliver more. And what the industry needs the world to want to do is demand and adopt environmentally better performing products, have an appetite in finance, for financing things that look more risky, that aren't the same things that we've done for the last 50, 60 years. And we also need to develop proven complementary technologies that go across supply chains, because if you intervene at one point in the supply chain, the rest of the supply chain doesn't change and you haven't actually, generally speaking, made much of an impact overall. This is what Axel and Bell were saying that they wanted to do in 2017 and it was their address, the way they were going to address low carbon sustainable manufacturing. They had three ways of looking at it. They had a drop in mechanism where you replace your fossil material with the same molecule manufactured through a more sustainable route. So the same molecule manufactured in a different way either a, a more intense process or a biological process or something different. Change the process so you replace the original material with a different material that's come from a more sustainable route, but the material does the same thing. Or you change a new product, you create a new product formulation system that completely replaces the original route. So an easy one to associate with at this end is they make water-based undercoat and water-based gloss now rather than high VOC related oil based paints to do the same thing. These are much more difficult for you to see what they're doing, but I don't know, many of you may or may not know, they built them quite a massive formulation plant at Cramlington and moved everything from Snow to Cramlington. And that's a significant, more efficient operation. It isn't doing this so much, but it is doing it a bit. At the moment, we seem to think that a, new, a totally new generation of technology is going to fix all our problems. And here are a couple of examples that you're kind of looking at them from a different lens, end of the telescope or a different lens. Making, storing and distributing hydrogen is a real challenge. It has the lowest ignition point of anything. It has an invisible flame and it tends to blow up a lot. Plus its energy density per kilo is fantastic, but its energy density per cubic meter is terrible. Producing it requires as much energy as it yields in use. So actually, in fact, if you're going to replace everything with hydrogen, you're going to need twice as much energy to make the hydrogen before, because you've got to make it before you can burn it. And Forbes magazine ran an article about how you manufacture hydrogen a bit ago, and they said that each, from a natural gas process, which is still the vast majority of hydrogen comes from natural gas processes, you produce about nine and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide per tonne of hydrogen that you produce. Because if you have to purify it, then you have to steam reform it, then you have to gas shift it, then you have to purify it again. And that's without the storage and distribution elements on top of it. 
So don't get the impression that I think hydrogen is a bad idea because I used to run the hydrogen team at CPI for a long period of time. It has really interesting things that it can do and it can play really interesting roles. But a lot of the energy and mass balances and engineering just aren't being done properly to be able to make decisions about where it should be used and where it shouldn't be used. And we're ending up in situations where we're using, we're, we're trying to take it out and replace it with something else, but it can only happen by making the price go up. And then if you make the price of the feedstock go up, then if you use that feed, that hydrogen to generate electricity, the price of the electricity goes up as well. So the economics are quite important. And then the other one is about electric vehicles. There are 31.7 million cars in the UK, and most drivers, the average driver drives 7,000 miles a year. You can get this data from PVL, so PVLA, sorry. I used to have a plug-in hybrid, hybrid. I don't anymore, because it used to break all the time, so I got rid of it. <laughs> but it, it used 10 kilowatt of hours of electricity for every 25 miles it traveled, so two and a half kilowatts per mile, hours per mile. If all UK cars were electric and that's efficient, we need 88 terawatt hours of electricity to power our cars. UK generating capacity in 2020 was 330 terawatt hours. So we need 21 gigawatts of additional generating capacity that was working all the time just to, just to charge our cars up. So again, thinking through where you're going to get the energy from to make this change happen, is something that we're not doing particularly well, and we don't have a policy to how we're going to address it, nor do we have a policy for our charging infrastructure, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so it's a great idea and a point of use. It's nice and clean, but it hasn't, isn't actually quite as simple as everybody's making it out to be at the moment. Plus, they're extremely expensive to make. This is not because I don't want to listen to it. Yeah. I just got to get a try it. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> you can tell me the rest of it when I get on with you. So again, it comes back to being more efficient in the use of resources. It doesn't. It isn't saying that these things are rubbish. What it's saying is we've got to think about how we're going to do it more effectively than we do at the moment. This is some work that my team. Uh, I used to have a team on um, advanced manufacturing sustainable manufacturing team so between t so Cambridge University when I was at CPI and they had this little model that was used by one of the uh, joint cross-party committees in government actually that you use resources you dig them up make them to raw materials you manufacture stuff you use it and then when you use it you throw it away so that was the, that was the thing if you can keep it in use for a much longer period of time oh you can reuse it then you don't throw as much away you don't make as much you don't need as many more raw materials and you don't need as many resources. If you then manage to remanufacture some of the things you've used, again, you don't throw as much away, you don't need as much raw material and you don't need as many resources. And if you recycle it, which is less preferable than remanufacturing it because you've got to put a lot of energy into it generally, you again don't throw as much away and you don't dig as much out of the ground. And their argument was if you start looking at the world like this, you should be able to change the balance of things. Now, there are massive vested interests in the companies that operate these places and these places and these places, and they don't want less to do. And at the moment in the UK, we're not very keen on this at all. So we don't actually try, we try not to do that, which doesn't help either. But there are ways of thinking about the integrated system that can reduce the impact of what we throw away and can reduce the impact of what we dig out of the ground but still maintain what we do in the middle. Again, economics, et cetera, are quite challenging. And, but this is quite a challenge for our economic system because it's driven by consumption and growth. And it's driven by different companies at different points each trying to make a profit in, in preference to everybody, in preference to the system operating. So you hope that your government and your policymakers start to think about this and start to worry about what we're going to do or how we're going to do it. So what are kinds of things that what I think you can be done couple of examples to start with. Now, this is a very old example now, but it's, it's fascinating, I think. Ashton, the Ashton Awards, from a long time ago, was a whole section on aerobic digestion. And this was about um, the genocide in Rwanda, so that's how old it is. But basically, lots of people got arrested, put in prison, displaced from where they were to somewhere else. And unfortunately, they all did quite a lot of pooing, and they all did quite a lot of cooking. So they chopped down all the trees and burnt all the trees and pooed everywhere. 
And somebody eventually came to this idea of, well, we could do something, we could change this. What we could do is build anaerobic digesters in the gardens and the prisons. And that would do more than one thing. Now, okay, an anaerobic digester is if you put something biological in a pit, you don't let any oxygen in, bugs start eating what's in there, and they generally speaking make methane, which is good. And because if you do that, and obviously you can make it look quite, you can see look, these, these are the inlet, you make it look quite nice, but you don't need to need your firewood anymore. Your sewage problem goes away, and it actually turns into fertilizer because they're not full of drugs like us. So human waste is difficult to use to grow things in, in, in our world because so many people are on some kind of medication that pollutes whatever you've got, but they haven't got that problem, generally speaking, here. So the problem goes away and the byproduct can be used as a fertilizer. So this is a true sustainable intervention in my eyes because it eliminates two problems, it creates solutions, and the other thing it did was it educated people to use their skills to repeat the benefit when they got went back to their villages. Because that was the idea on top of all the other things. And that's why it won a national award in 2015 or something like that. That's quite a long time ago. But it closes loops and it uses waste as resources. This one's an efficiency one that I had experienced when I worked for ICA a long time ago on the plastic films plants in Dumfries. I won't go through it in massive detail for you. But fundamentally, you take polymer and you turn it into a film, you cut the edges off. You make product that you send to the customer, the edges go to waste, you fail product, that goes to waste, you recycle that and you feel it back, feed it back and convert it back all into film again. Or you flog it to a company in Ireland that turns it into fibres. Without going through the detail, I'll get you a PDF copy of this if you want. We used to have 40% first pass efficiency, so 60% of everything we made was just going round and round in circles. We put a huge amount of effort into getting it to go round and round in circles, so our raw material efficiency was really high, but it, a lot of it was going round and round. Then we put the next lot of effort into how we couldn't get the first pass efficiency up so that the prime material went up, and we got from 40% to 60%. And our total value at 40%, this was on 100 tonnes of polymers, was two and a half thousand pounds. And when we got to 60%, it was 4,300 pounds. But we also needed a heck of a lot more polymer. So we had to make our polymer plant bigger. So the capacity of our plants went up massively. And that's why the value went up. But a 20% operation improvement again gave a 75% increase in profitability for the plant. There's probably a lot of situations where that happens. Now this one, you could do it because you were in control of all of those steps. In most supply chains, you're not in control of all of those steps. So you have to think about how you're going to make it work. This is an example that Graham will know from a long time ago. And it's a specific example related to what's called a battle reactor, which is a different way. It's a chemical reactor that's much smaller than a normal big stirred tank one. So you've got lower inventory in, in oscillating tube, basically. You make what you need to make rather than making what the size of the tank is, and it's plug flow, so it's potentially easier to clean out. The mixing in it is highly efficient. The capital cost comes down by anything up to 50%, so that your return can come much quicker. And your operating cost can come down by anything up to 90% as well. Now, it doesn't work for everything. It only works for certain things in certain circumstances, but in a number of situations, this has worked unbelievably well to the extent that there's one product, project within 15 years ago we're still not talk, allowed to talk about because the company that did it kind of built a little plant on the sly without telling anybody and completely changed the dynamic of the industry and they still haven't kind of complained about it really. But lower capital and operating costs, less resources, and less waste. So there are ways and those, these technologies all exist and there's one called the, called the continuous flow reactor which is a glass reactor, similar reactor to this. The Chinese are investing 15, 20 million pounds a year just in trying to get that reactor to work for three or four reactions. There's an example on the CPI website that involved Croda and a company called Nitec, and you can see what they actually did because they have told the world what they did in their reactor to change the way that they made the products that they were making to get those kinds of benefits. So there are ways of doing these things, but you can't do what you did in the past. And then the other thing is whole systems, materials manufacturing use are integrated together. This is a piece of work I did for Arab again quite a long time ago now. 
and it was uh, it's discussed in a thing called en Entering the Ecological Age, the Engineer's Role, which was written by Arab as the Brunel Lecture about uh, probably seven or eight years ago now. But you've got process complexes to make chemicals, you've got heat production, you've got power generation, you've got vehicles over here coming out of it, and then you've got sewage, food waste, brewing and distillery waste, the biodiesel and bioethanol waste going into it. And we have a fossil fuel production plant here, which most effectively is a gasifier with fossil carbon and dry wastes going into it. They get made into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Carbon dioxide goes into growing plants quickly. The plant matter goes into biotechnology and refining, and you can get oils, foods, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, alkanes, alkanes, alkyne, hydrogen out of that. You generally speaking, you put back biomass into that as well. Obviously, you need light into here, but that produces oxygen, but it does produce carbon dioxide as well. So you have to catch that and feed it back in. So this thing here is it goes into an anaerobic digester. If you can clean it up, it can go to fertilizer to land to make things grow. Carbon dioxide and nutrients come out that can help you grow your plants faster. And if you put them all together, then you can recycle the water around the system as well. And we did the calculation. Well, them that showed that a city of a million people, you could actually reduce its emissions by 97%. But you had to put all of these plants next to one another. So you couldn't have your water treatment plant over there and your power station over there and your waste treatment plant over here. You actually had to integrate them together. And if you integrated in all your, your cement factories and your steelworks and whatever with that system, you could make, you could actually keep it that low. But obviously, there's, there are issues here, like anaerobic digestion isn't really well enough developed to work properly. Although people know this works, it isn't actually used in hydroponics or aeroponics or any of those other kinds of things that are really effective because consume those extra things. And again, these things all exist and have been proven, but with the exception of uh, AFHE foods at Drake Whissington, who integrated everything there, sugar beet factories together to be able to do this brilliantly. Almost nobody does it, but it can be done. So what could be done? You could create a low carbon resource efficient community by integrating a set of projects together, but you'd have to combine industrial, residential, agricultural and transport to be able to get the real benefit out of it. And that would actually, if you did it well, exploit the inherent strengths of communities and regions. We're talking a bit King Charles here, actually, but it, more extreme from an engineering point of view than he would ever consider. And that would deliver economic well-being. So to make that work, you need to facilitate links between research, development, commercial interests, because you've got to create value through the whole thing. You've got to look at a range of supply partnerships that are appropriate to make all those things link together. And that means you've got to build supply chain networks. And, and you, you do it locally. You can't do this globally. And there are examples in the UK where when the cracker here is working, it makes ethylene that gets shipped to Rungborn. They make it into ethylene dichloride. Ethylene dichloride goes on a ship to Germany, where it gets made into vinyl and chloride monogram, and then it gets made into PVC, and then the PVC comes back to the UK to be compounded. And that's because the old integrated supply chain isn't integrated anymore. The supply chain is still integrated, and it's still owned by the same company. But rather than having three lots of everything in the same place, you've got bits all around Europe. Final thoughts. What is the best response then? This is a bit philosophical really. Is it more recycling? Is it longer time in use? Is it more reuse? Is it more, in or is it near net shape manufacturing? We haven't actually talked about that. Well, that's making things the shape, the shape you want them before you, uh, and making them once so you don't make them massive and then cut loads of things off to make them. But there isn't a correct answer. It's a combination of things and it depends on a combination of common sense economics social environment and manufacturing processes, but it does need people to think more into in a more integrated way. So the principles are, you've got to accept that it's impossible to fully decarbonize as life and most of the products that we use are actually based on carbon. But it is possible to improve the efficiency and improve the use of the products to reduce the carbon consumption or the carbon emissions. And there's a significant opportunity in using or reusing naturally derived products 
biomimicry as well as naturally derived roots or waste feedstocks. And often legislative legislation stops you using a waste feedstock as a, a waste product as a feedstock in another chain because it has to change use and that's difficult to do. Growing plants consume carbon dioxide. There are chemical processes that can consume carbon dioxide as well, but carbon dioxide is very stable. So process developers need to be very creative to create economically viable processes. They are starting to appear now though, and there are companies that are doing quite well in this space. Making chemicals and materials in a lower carbon economy is challenging, but it is possible. But you've got to think about it in a different way. So the global drivers and the trends are favouring resource efficient approach to these things. But if that's going to happen, we've got to look at engineering problems differently. We've got to make sure the policy makers and the business leaders and the engineers understand that change is needed and is possible. We've got to aspire to change it, which we often don't do, I'm afraid. Well, we do. I would think probably everybody sitting here probably here does aspire to change this. But it's extremely difficult because the system often doesn't help you. And an awful lot of collaborative working needed across technical boundaries, but also social boundaries here. Because there's social change is required and adoption is different. And you don't, you know, you don't naturally socially want to change something. And, and often when somebody comes to well, like when Apple first said you all need a mobile phone, we all said, no, we don't, but now we can't live without one. So this is difficult. You need a legislative and regulatory environment that's actually favourable to this. And that means you can't just make blanket numbers that we're going to reduce something by 50%. It isn't necessarily possible to do it. You've got to take account of the value of finite resources in your economics as well. That's going to come home to us pretty strongly in, that, in the next 10, 15 years, I think. And you've also got to make attractive, reliable and usable products and demonstrate there are benefits. So there's a big opportunity here. But you need to change behaviour and you need, you need to do something about it. So my future challenges are develop more sustainable processes. So they're the ones that have got lower impact. Use your resources more efficiently. Don't throw stuff away. So the UK consumes 10 million tonnes of cardboard a year. It imports 6.5 million tonnes and it imports 1.5 million tonnes of bulk. So it makes about 3 million tonnes of its own. It recycles about 2.5 million tonnes and it exports about a million tonnes to Europe and about 4.5 million tonnes of cardboard to Asia as cardboard. So we're pretending, again, that we recycle it, but we don't. We send it to another country and I hope they recycle it. And the same is true for steel. There's a few of you in this room that will know the numbers there. And the same is true for glass. So we're doing really daft stuff which is wasting our resources. Looking at in integrated efficiency, think about how processes are linked together. Convert wastes to products. And we've just mentioned an example of that. Convert, convert batch processes to continuous ones, but only where it's more efficient. It isn't always, but there is a way of working out whether it is. Create more flexible processes. I think we've got to go to a world where we need smaller plants that are more effective. More, so it's worked brilliantly with microbreweries, and it actually worked with mini mills in the steel industry. So it's not a small plant, but it's much smaller than the alternative. And that's where people are trying to take nuclear power stations at the moment. There are loads and loads of opportunities there. But again, you've got to say, I want to do something different from what I did last time. And the other thing is make better use of biosystems and mimic natural processes because evolution can tell us a lot of what works and what doesn't. So I would say that's closed loops, efficient processes, end-to-end -end knowledge of the process through its supply chain, and link the raw material to the product to be used to the end of life so that you actually can do something. But it, again, the companies don't necessarily fit across there. So my conclusions are design things that use as little energy as possible, make or build them as efficiently as possible, preferably with reuse in mind. Think about resource flows before you do your design. Think about resource flows through communities and systems because there's an awful lot there that you can get at. Think about how wastes can be eliminated or used as fuels or feedstocks. You've got to drive collaborative interdisciplinary working and you've got to do something. And in reduce, reuse, recycle was the mantra, wasn't it? And we added relate to that. Now, really what we need to integrate, but that doesn't begin in R. So you have to pick a word that begins with R for it to work. So we went for relate. And this is something that somebody said to me 
once upon a time, not that far, probably about seven or eight years ago now. Four industrial revolutions changed the world forever. The next must make sure it lasts that long. And that's all I've got to say to you. So I haven't given you an answer, I understand that. But hopefully I've challenged you to think about things a bit differently from the way that you've thought about them in the past. Thank you, Murray. Can we stop sharing? Oh, I don't know if you'll get up. I'm probably. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for Graham? Sorry. When calculated the CO2 per person, have you allowed for the number of trees and plants that are? No, I've just taken it off the list that people like Edgar and the UN put out. And to be honest, I mean, yeah, I'll stop sharing that. <laughs> um, I don't, depending on whose series of data you look at, the numbers can be a couple of kilograms per person different as well. So the World Bank's different from the UN. So that it's not a particularly fine art doing this. I don't know if you've ever tried to work out your own carbon footprint, but it's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Is there any way we can encourage people to? mend and repair things because i remember once taking a 30 quid watch to a jewelers to get it repaired and they were going to charge me 85 quid we're well, not going to do that are you you're going to chuck it and buy a new one yeah i don't know how you do it well you've got to design things to repair them yeah oh yes yeah, I remember us, when our kids were little so having a big debate between because we used to buy a washing machine every two years that threw it cost us 300 pounds because it was un unrepairable but we could have a melee one for 700 quid with a 10 year guarantee, which is what we did, and we still got it now. <laughs> so, and it's repairable as well, but the German bits are pretty expensive. But you can buy things that are repairable, you just usually have to pay more for them in the first place, don't you? Well, yes, and I, I suppose it's trying to get that message across to people that it's better for all concerned if you do do that but then you've got to stump up the 700 quid in the first yeah. place and we? we are very disposable aren't we yeah terrible terrible and um, that's because we're affluent yeah and, and another thing we're going to have a problem disposing of is going to be all these batteries from all these electric cars what yeah we're going to do with all those i mean they're, they're eminently recyclable but it's not Good. it's not a trivial exercise mm. In fact, there's no battery recycling plant in the UK for ordinary batteries. They all get sent to France where they all get pyrolyzed. Well, they recover all the materials. Mm -hmm. There is still a plant in the UK that recycles car batteries, I think. Re recycles the lead and recycles the acid. I think they even recycle. I think UK batteries are made of polypropylene, so which is different from most other people's. And I think they recycle that as well. Somewhere in Derbyshire. But that's on its last legs too, because it's the last remaining plant in the UK that processes this thing, and it's lead, and that's horrible. Um, on your presentation, you showed an example, I think it was a, a beet, a sugar beet processor. No, no, I mentioned the sugar beet. And you said, this is really good, but nobody does it. Nobody yeah. else does it. Why does nobody else do it if it's really good? What's the, the barriers to well, that? Again, Graham might remember this as well. That, that, that I mentioned, that, that process I mentioned, about the company that invested and didn't tell anybody and they invested. Yeah. The project happened and all the evidence was that was the thing that had to be invested in. And it was like less than a tenth of the price of the replacement plan that they built 30 years earlier. When it went to the board, the board went, oh no, we can't invest in that. How do we know it's going to work? Well, well our preference is to build what we built, another one of what we built 30 years ago, because we know that works. So I think, I think, a lot of financial decisions are driven by what the people who are investing perceive to be um, security and simplicity and provenness. But building something that's 30 years out of date isn't actually that, even though it looks like it is to the financial mm -hmm. investor. So, so, so the, there's an awful lot of education and thinking about things differently. And a lot of us are kind of guilty of getting paid money to do things and we do the thing we got paid. And even though we know it's not necessarily the right thing, we aren't brave enough to tell anybody. I bet all of us have been in that uh, situation. Yeah. 
Yes, it was just a question about anaerobic digestion because I was quite surprised when you said that that doesn't, it's not a widely used technique. It, it's widely used, but it isn't very efficient. Sure. Well, that might explain quite a lot. I know that my last mm -hmm. business, they had their own effluent plant and used anaerobic digestion, yeah. and it was seen as the thing yeah. that they need. Oh, it, 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 it definitely is. is. Yeah, and I was saying I, I work with a chemical company in concert and we have an analytic digester. And in my time at ICI, I have polyethylene polyterra. Poly, what's it called? PTA plant. <laughs> acid plant. Oh, yeah, that had an AD plant. That yeah, if anybody remembers, there's a thing called deep shaft processing. That's a version of an AD plant. And when we had cumene phenol plants, we used AD plants to treat the wastes for them as well. So there are bugs that will eat almost anything. But they often get built and left these things, like which is what's happened to the one this chemical plant that I work with. It's not running; it's running less than half as efficiently as it ought to be. Yeah, so yes, it's extremely well proven and has been used for years and years and years. But I think you can probably get more out of it, and they often run at oh, bloody mesophilic and what's the other one? Somebody that knows and understands biology. Anyway, there's different temperatures and there are different sets of bugs and the higher temperature you get a higher yield, but it's a different bug culture that lives in there. So, you know, there's a lot that can be done with it that isn't done yet. But yeah, you're right. It is widely used, but you actually get a lot more digestate than you get gas out of it, basically. Alan. Well, I do have a question, but I know I noticed that Paul Frank's got a hand. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just... So I think I'll, I'll let him ask Thanks, Thanks, Alan. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah I, I was thinking uh, I, I'm in agreement with the thrust of uh, most of the things that have been uh, proposed. Um, like, as a society of consumers, we're not very good at making maybe the most informed choices when we buy things. I know that we've got energy guidelines in terms of how energy efficient uh, an application, uh, an appliance may be, but in terms of the company producing many of the things that we buy, if they were to engineer and make stuff with reuse and recycle and recovery in mind, and then on that on that uh, on that goods, uh, there would be a stamp, as you would put a stamp on something that's energy efficient, uh, and that stamp give you an idea of what was going to be recoverable. Was it all recoverable and reusable and um, recyclable? In which case, then that might sort of you know temp temper your, your, your sort of decision to yeah i'm prepared to pay the extra little bit of cash because it's got a 10 rather than a one uh and it's gonna it's gonna be reused and i'm doing some good uh and if the product's up to it well yeah i mean that, that's that comes into it of course anyway um but i don't seem to have seen anything unless i've missed something uh out there other than someone trying to sell me another new uh, another mobile phone when I've got one that works and I've had it a number of years. Um, and so as a, a society of consumers, I think, you know, we, we're sort of, we could do a lot better. Good, but do you know, I think partly it's us as well, that we always want the newest one rather than putting up with one that does what it's always done. Uh, I don't mean us, I'm not sitting here. I mean, us generally, yeah, yeah. people. I but but I think people would consider if if they were told well this one is slightly well not quite as good as the the, the really you know all singing and dancing one, but it's not far off and it'll do what you want it to do. And by the way, we're going to use all the parts again, and they're not going to go into landfill. Now, if yeah. if I was to know that, I'd say yeah, I'll take the one that okay, it does what I want it to do, uh, but it's not going to end up in landfill. Yeah, I, I'm sure you're right. I th there are there are a lot of clothes now that are, have labels that say they're recycled polyester, for instance. Yeah. So I think, to be honest, they probably always have been, but <laughs> my time at Dumfries, which is like the early 80s, we used to try and make, we made film out of our polymer, and if we failed to film and we couldn't recycle it anymore in our own plant, we'd sell it to fibre makers. Yeah. And I know that in Korea, this whole system is you make, you make, polyester, you make it into bottles. If you can't make bottles out of it, you make fire, film out of it. If you can't make film out of it, you make fibre out of it. And all the all three plants, and well, and the polymer plant, all four plants are on the same site and they're all integrated together. So everything that comes out of the polymer plant gets sold somewhere. 
because they thought that's the best way to make loads of money and mm. it works for them. Yeah, but nearly all polyester fiber, particularly in any, anything that's in a, a pillow or the insulation in your jacket or all of that's definitely recycled and has been for 30 years. So it's not, you know, it's not, then it's not rubbish. We're just not as good as we could be, I think. Did you have a question, Alan? Oh, I've always got a question. Sorry. Usually it'd be I'm difficult not. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, right, which one I shall I choose? Um, <laughs> Rick Graham's message is 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 all about what what we all instinctively know, but we've got to we've got to use less and we've got to do it more efficiently, and there's a lot of challenges there. But the the government's message and most Western governments' messages are uh, that uh, we'll pin our hopes on hydrogen, we'll pin our hopes on CO2 capture, we'll generate a lot of green electricity. And if you scratch the surface of the rate at which industries anywhere have developed, the numbers just don't match up. We're not, in 2050, we're gonna be nowhere near the aspirations. How do we cut through the misinformation and, and, and get, belief that that things are the way we actually know they're going to have to be i think we've got we've got to start actually saying things don't we? we've got to start writing things that that demonstrate these kinds of things i think we probably ought to have a word with chris as well because he might be able to do something for us <laughs> in a couple of years time <laughs> maybe, maybe. On, on but, but i mean a lot of it a lot of this is how do you inform people in, in a way and the, the UK currently has a culture where an expert that knows what they're talking about can't give advice because they must have a vested interest and and until that attitude changes as a nation we're in a pretty difficult position I think and I don't know how to change it actually Alan but I think we've just got to keep trying. One, one slightly positive thing that I came across was uh, one of the groups that I talked to is uh, run by Julian Oldwood who came to university called and he has something called the use less or useless depending on how you want to, uh, <laughs> to to read it through and they published a report with very much the same message that you're that report is now the most downloaded publication that anyone in Cambridge University has ever produced. So um, if we might be having difficulty influencing the current government and generation, um, the, the generation are currently in the university community, you, you could see what which direction they're moving. Yeah, I think that's right. And you can see that, can't you, and have anything to do with that group of people. They are a bit more aware. But I think I, I think I don't, I don't know how you get into a position where you can actually really influence it, these things. I mean, when I, it's weird because when I was the planner and, and like I said, Mark was, was the planner as well. So we had North Tees, Wilton and Billingham for those of you that are old enough to remember. We ran those as an integrated set of operations with what would now be called digital twin to decide what we were going to do every day. And we, we, our power station could run oil, gas, coal and tallow. And our hydrogen system, because it was a big, that's 56,000 ton a year hydrogen system, we could consume hydrogen or produce hydrogen depending on what we needed to run the plants because we were using it to make nitrobenzene and cyclohexane. Well, then if we were overproducing hydrogen, we could consume it in the methanol plant. And, and every day we'd make a decision about how we were going to run those assets to get the biggest margin out of them and the, the biggest yield. Because we also had an oil pipeline and an oil refinery, so we actually actually had absolutely everything. Now, none of that integration is there anymore, and each company that is still there that has to has to transfer from one to another. And when one plant disappears out of the system, then don't the downstream of it all go as well. So I think we've lost the idea of how do you integrate things together, and also we 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 seem to have this this view at the moment that you just buy stuff. And its stuff is always infinitely available, even though you can't buy it from Russia anymore and you hate the Chinese. It's just not, it's just not the way 
things work. And, and we've, I suppose we've just got to be brave enough to take the risk to talk about it a bit more. Uh, the gentleman right at the back had a question. Um, when I was at school, um, you judged the uh, wealth of the country by the amount of sulfuric acid it produced. Now we've seen if you judge it by the amount of CO2 it produced. Yeah. And the UK produces no sulfuric acid anymore because mm -hmm. the last plant shut two, two and a half years ago. And the, you know, sulfuric acid is used in quite a lot of chemical yeah. processes. Well, they're made very important. That was the theory that yeah. the mock products you made that use it. Yeah, yeah and we shut so all the up for my car batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Not fuel okay, are there any more questions either here or online at all? There's no hands up. No hands I've up. obviously depressed you enough for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just one oh, really quick one. Just in terms of that fourth arm oh, that you told me yeah. in terms of women, I think for people to make a substantial difference themselves as well as the society and the whole, I think it has to be relatable. They have to to see it in that way. And I think when we talk about using mess and the misinformation that's out there, people will think, well, what about what's happening here before they look elsewhere? And we know that, you know, people in Glasgow, for instance, some of them have a lower um, standard of living or life expectancy than the sub-Saharan African. So why would they look that's uh, the thing when there's things on there that's different online. Yeah. I think your interpretation of relate is really important there because the way, the way we thought about it was everything relates together, so it integrates. But your point is that people have to relate to the discussion as well. And I think that, yeah. that's a really important thing. But, and, and you know, it isn't all bad, is it? Because cars get recycled, reused loads and loads of times <laughs> through their lives. And there are, eBay is probably, you know, the biggest recycling system in the world kind of thing, or vintage now. Yeah. Because some things that would have been, would have gone somewhere get sold or get used again. So, so there are things that are work, you know, I mean, I, I suppose I've been a bit negative, really, but there are things that are working. Well, probably what we need to do is reinforce the ones that work rather than, and I think a lot of these people that, we, we need to help everybody understand that, these, that this is a good way to do things, to reuse things and put them back through the system is, is a good thing to do. There's a good example of Caterpillar. Uh, used to have a plant, I think they still do, in Shrewsbury that remanufactures engines. And they do tank engines and train engines and stuff like that. But they get 5 million miles out of the 400,000 pound, 400,000 mile design and train engines by taking it back every 400,000 miles and rebuilding it from as many components as they keep it possible. But they found that they couldn't get enough engines back, so they had to put new engines out into the system three of them, so that they were very successful at it. So, that, you know, there are, there are good examples, but they're not very well known and they're not reinforced, I don't think. Well, isn't that part of the problem that we need to um, shout about our successes and yeah. sort of put across that, you know, this is what we should be doing and make it hip and trendy to have a yeah. four-year-old mobile phone instead of buying a new one every year? Yeah, and I mean, things like the geopolymer work that's going on here, that's right in this space. That's a really important point about that, you know, sharing success, you know, one thing yeah. more just for me. Yeah, mm. it does. And and people and people can see it's possible, can't they? Okay, well I think we've had a fairly robust discussion on all that. Um are you happy, Graham, for us to have a copy of your slides? Yeah, I'll give you a PDF copy. Yes, that would be yeah. better. And I'll stick it on the website and then I can circulate the link um with the next newsletter. Right. There's a stick there. So anyway, I think it only remains for me to thank Graham once again. And um, if we show our appreciation in the usual way. Thank you. Um, there's two sandwiches and tea and coffee and stuff uh, just outside here if you'd all like to have a nibble and continue to discuss further. Thank you.